so uh, I'll, I'll use this for purposes of illustrating my words. Um, if I could just introduce myself, that's my name's Rob Fowler, and uh, uh, I'm uh, a law professor in Australia at the University of South Australia, and I'm also chair um, of the IUC Academy of Environmental Law. And the Academy is a network of law schools from all around the world. It's something like, I think, 100, 158 law schools now that have joined the Academy represents over 500 legal scholars specialising in environmental law from around the world and it's grown very rapidly. <coughs> We've worked with the Environmental Law Centre to make a small contribution to the workshop today uh, in this next session. Um, in think thinking about how to do this, and, and I have to apologise also for not having been with you for the whole of the day. Many of us, this simultaneous <laughs> events going on all over the place, and uh, therefore it just wasn't possible to be here as we earlier on today. Um, but we thought, in terms of how to uh, conduct this session, that given that the, uh, the basic structure of the day is around the rights based approach and the different steps involved in that. Of course, we were thinking about this months ago before we come to the occasion today and um, see the composition of the room and, and the way in which the discussion has gone. We thought that what we would try to do was to contribute to what I think is the fifth step in the process, which is reasoned decision making. And we asked ourselves as lawyers, well, um, how could we? I might sit down. Is that okay? I don't even want to sit down. How could? <coughs> How could we bring something from a legal perspective to this question of making reasoned decisions? And the context of which we chose there uh, arose out of research that we've been pursuing through workshops with the Environmental Law Centre. Um, and we chose uh, payment for ecosystem services as, as the context. So I think to some extent this fits loosely into part of what I understand has been the discussion just as the end, on the end of that. Um, the concept of payment for ecosystem services is becoming more and more prominent in environmental law and policy. Um, unlike some of the bottom-up processes that I think you were talking about uh, in terms of where communities are generating initiatives, it may often be the case that payment for ecosystem services through various mechanisms <coughs> is something that, that it could be presented to a community uh, as an option for them. Uh, and, and to that extent is perhaps more of a top-down approach. And it, it means that one that, that where, where a proposal is made of that nature, there really is a need to say, well, how are we going to decide whether this proposal is worthwhile in the interests of, of community, in the interests of the ecosystem or the ecosystem services that it relates to. So I, I think I just want to introduce it now. I don't want to take a long time to do it, but to try to make the connections between the overall theme of today's event and, and this particular session. Um, there was a slide presentation that we thought we might use which tried to explain the concept of ecosystem services, but it, it seems to me that that's a completely unnecessary exercise in, in this room listening to all of the discussion that has taken place. We, we, in the presentation, we used a web man as an example of the various types of ecosystem services, but one of the first things that struck me was to Lynn Harmon, who has been here today, was the, the conception that that presentation had of what is an ecosystem <coughs> service is probably much narrower than some of the uh, ideas that you've been talking about today. So with, with, with that introduction, I, I thought what we can do is, what we, what we hope to do is to just have a, a round table discussion around this topic uh, for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. We may not go as long as we had planned because you're know, a little bit behind schedule and we're trying to help catch up. And I, what, what I'd like to do is to introduce two, two uh, people who have been very important to the Academy to help lead the discussion from here. Um, firstly, Professor Ben Bohr, who's already known to many of you, Ben um, has, has been professor for many years at the University of Sydney Law School. He's a former director of the 
the IEC and Academy of Environmental Law and is now also spending some of his time um, as a uh, professor in the uh, research centre for environmental law at Wuhan University. Um, ben will probably lead us off on some, I think, really important questions around <coughs> whose rights and what kinds of rights are actually involved in this concept. After that, I'll ask Tim Harmon, who's from Pace University Law School, the Centre for Environmental Legal Studies, and, 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 and Lynn will, I think, pick up a, a, quite a bit more on some of the other presentations, particularly, I think, by Rao earlier today, and try to tease out some of the issues around this concept and what it really means in terms of tagging aside whether this is a good opportunity or not, whether this concept of payment for the system services. Is, is, is something that we, we, we can be seen as, 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 a, a positive, as a positive tool for the future, a positive tool, or whether there are difficulties and dangers that one needs to be aware of. So with those, with those comments, perhaps I'll, I'll hand over to Ben now and ask him to start posing some curly questions for us to figure out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, I want to ask some questions and try and uh, just give some comment on this whole question of rights-based approaches uh, related to ecosystem services as well as more generally in terms of environmental decision making, uh, both in developed and developing countries. I do most of my work in, in the Asian region uh, and so I might just draw one or two examples from there as this discussion goes on. But when you look at the question of uh, rights-based approaches and, uh, and then thinking through particularly the previous topic of ensuring participation, there are many correspondences, it seems to me. When we think about uh, the, the particular topic that has been assigned to us of <coughs> making reasoned decisions, we need to ask who is involved in the decisions? Who is participating? Who makes the decision? To involve or not the control. And that comes down to what level the decisions are made at. And of course, that depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, if you look at uh, La PDF that Paddy and uh, Rafael were talking about, um, there are, of course, many layers of decision making. The, the one that they've been looking at is, in fact, at, at a very basic community level, and then trying to fit what happens at the community level uh, into a broad statutory institutional framework which may have no relevance initially at least uh, to, uh, to, to what happens at the community level. Um, so the, the, one, the, the first question is who is involved in, in the decision? Um, this then depends on how much information is available to make those decisions as to whether or not people ought to be involved. In other words, if people don't know uh, about uh, a, a particular development activity that might be proposed, they simply cannot be involved and therefore they cannot take decisions reasoned or not. And this then depends on whether or not an environmental impact assessment has been done or so, some other kind of, of planning and, and the environmental assessment process is in place. If they are in place, then it's still, still a question then of saying, okay, what do we mean by equity in this respect? And uh, when you look, for instance, at the Conservation with Justice book that uh, Thomas Kraber and others uh, have worked on and, and uh, is available, um, that uh, particular uh, book uh, talks about, for example, the two strands of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, in terms of rights. On the one hand, inherent value of biodiversity, and on the other hand, the rights of uh, people uh, themselves. So in other words, ecological values on the one hand and human values on the other. So in other words, I would ask the question, are we just talking about human rights or are we also talking about inherent value and the rights, uh, the intrinsic rights of the environment? Can we talk about those? Well, some philosophers uh, would maintain that that's indeed what we should be talking about. We just voted on a motion today for the rights of incorporating the rights of nature into IUC and decision making as a focal point. Yeah. So I'm sorry, David. Oh, no, thank you, Ben. And in fact, in 1982, if you look at the UN, uh, the UN uh, uh, resolution uh, uh, 
from 1982, you see precisely that that was incorporated already that long ago, 30 years ago. Um, so when we think about uh, whose rights, we need to think in, in both narrowly in terms of human rights as, also, as well as in terms of ecological values and the rights of the environment to continue to exist. This reminds me a little bit of addressing an audience in New Zealand about 15 years ago talking about uh, environmental rights and uh, putting the proposition that human rights were central to this question of decision making. And, uh, a Maori person got up with a lawyer and said, but when you're talking about rights and we're talking about the rights of the rights of people, we also must talk about the rights of nature. Um, and the reason is is because nature is part of us. The tree out there could be one of my ancestors. Uh, and although I may not directly be able to ask the tree, I assume uh, that it has a continued right to exist uh, in, in a clean, healthy environment, for example. So th they are some basic questions. Then you have to ask, <coughs> what is the legal context? And again, going back to the previous discussion about access to law, obviously local communities have access to their own customary law, and a great number of them local and indigenous communities around the world think that that is the most important aspect. If you look at the, uh, what happens in the in indigenous communities in Australia, more traditional ones, uh, would say, okay, we exist under two systems of law. One of them is our law, and the rest is the one that is imposed <coughs> upon us. It's no different from the Royal PDR in the sense uh, of, of the statutory law which has been brought in basically from France and elsewhere uh, into Laos. Uh, and, and they're looking at what the local people have developed over hundreds if not thousands of years. So what is the legal context is very important. The customary law context on the one hand, the statutory law context on the other, and how these two can be married if that is a good idea. So when we think then about reasoned decisions, uh, we need to think seriously about the legal context. We need to think about whether or not uh, it is based in, in fact uh, in scientific fact, we can define that, um, whether it is based on local ecological knowledge as well as scientific expertise. So the kinds of fundamental questions that I would ask here are uh, the ethical aspects uh, of, uh, of uh, paying for ecosystem services, um, and particularly when they apply to poorer people. Are the payments equitably distributed? Think about red agreements, for example where um, there's a huge amount of corruption, potential corruption, uh, so that um, the payments for ecosystem services in relation to holding the carbon uh, in the trees uh, does not go to the local people who are, um, or does not go sufficiently to the local people who are actually doing the work uh, to keep those forests, forests intact. So there's a whole range of, of questions here uh, which we can pose, but I'll stop there for the moment because I think I've asked enough questions and made enough points probably going to disagree with me sufficiently um, to uh, carry the discussion further. Well. Okay. I'm not sure how it ended up back with me. But <laughs> <laughs> You're chairing. Yes, okay. If we take what Ben said, I, I, I think perhaps we uh, just to summarise it in, in, in one question first of all, with the rights-based approach, which was really what you first came here today to talk about, uh, I mean, is it essentially a human-centred approach? Is, is it an approach which at the end of the day has limitations in terms of its um, recognition and acknowledgement of nature, <coughs> nature's rights, the, the, the ecosystem rights? I just invite some discussion around that for this question. I have I have to confess that uh, since I arrived this morning I checked many times and really the, the detail of the of the of the training course. Um, because I, I I had something else in my mind when uh, thinking about a right based approach. Uh, and I will explain you. Uh, and I, I am a practitioner, and I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm working with communities, um, and I am working, uh, trying to work, uh, and thinking a lot uh, about rights and how rights help to preserve 
uh, to preserve uh, the environment. Um, and it is directly linked because I'm working in communities where the level of education is very low. Uh, people barely know how to read, to write. Most of, the, most of them don't know how to, to write. Um, and they are not aware of their rights, uh, of basic rights. Very basic rights, they are not aware that, for example, the state has to protect them, has to guarantee uh, access to water, that they can claim their right. Uh, and there are some very simple rights that are on the Constitution. I'm working on Ecuador, the, the new Ecuadorian Constitution. Um, and they don't know that they can claim this right. And it's directly linked because they see day after day logging log of the, um, uh, the trees on that mountain and then they have no water in the river. Mm. But they say, okay, it's like this. They are not empowered. And for me that was that, the point of the right based approach. It was Empowering people through eh, uh, an uh, uh, awareness of, of their rights, so that they can take decision. And uh, it's the and I'm not only talking about uh, right of indigenous people. Uh, we have some in interesting example, of, but we were not talking, at least in, in the last in la last case, of empowering people. Eh? And when uh, I'm working on participation, <coughs> that is a huge movement uh, since the decades in, in, in South America, uh, we are talking about that. We are talking about building identities, sharing, sharing common values. We are talking about ethics. For me, really, the, 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 the point here is how us as practitioners talk about ethics. Because ethics mean common value, common value makes rules, rules makes governance systems, etc. So it was just, I, 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 I wanted to, to put that, that on the table because I was, feel, I felt a little confused because I, was, I have not the same uh, tuning uh, on that. Of course, it may be related, but I was just wanted to, to put that uh, on the table. I might just respond to that very briefly because in Ecuador and Bolivia there is now a constitutional provision about the rights of Mother Nature. Yeah. Um, and, and this is something which is really a, an expression of the 1982 uh, UN Charter on, on, on Nature. Um, it just took a long time for it to filter into constitutions. But I think we're going to see as new constitutions are drafted, uh, particularly in South America, that that idea will continue to exist. What does it need though? And what it seems to mean in Ecuador and Bolivia uh, is that uh, all decision making on the environment must relate to that constitutional <coughs> provision um, in a very practical kind of way. But, in, but and you raised this question: of who, who enforces it? Are the systems in place where any person can actually bring an action to actually enforce the the, 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 the rights? Uh, and that, that means, and do you have a, a, an environment or a green court? Uh, do you have a, a situation where lawyers are able to bring uh, these actions? Uh, do you have a situation where people can participate in the decisions to bring the actions and on whose behalf? So all these very interesting questions need to be thought about. Just to, to so, and, and, and uh, really starting from from the beginning, uh, they don't know that they have a right. So more it's a problem of pedagogy. Right? Sure. They just can go to a judge and say, they are cutting my trees. That That's it. So we've got two more contributions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, just uh, one update on this topic, and that is, we heard yesterday in one of the session rooms I was attending that um, New Zealand, there was a recent court case in New Zealand granting a river the rights of a human with respect to, to the Constitution. Yes. So they're going to treat, well, at least according mm. to this court case, mm. the river will be treated as a human oh. uh, for purposes of applying constitutional that, that invokes shades of a, a very famous article written mm -hmm. in 1972 by Christopher Stone, a uh, legal philosopher. Lawrence Tribe, in fact. 
was Christopher Stone who wrote Should Trees Have Standing? Oh, no, right, yeah, Should yeah. Trees Have Standing, which was about the procedural right yeah. of the suit. Um, I, 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 I had... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, then, then, uh, I think I, I come from Southern Africa. Yeah, I think for some of you, uh, you know, yeah. So can you just the microphone? Oh, yeah. Should sure. Trees Have Standing. Uh, we have been really advocating for what we call community-based natural risk management. And I think it was actually being influenced by this uh, rights based approach to development. But I think the way how we have been doing it is basically focusing on the, the people. That is, community should have access to these resources, but without looking at the, the, the environment itself or nature itself having its own rights. And so, on. so I think it's important that these developments that are happen, happening in South America um, <coughs> also begin to be reflected in Southern Africa because us, the focus is still on human people, on humans, communities, but without also realizing that that can also have some serious problems, whereby the focus is on them getting benefits on but without necessarily concerning the environment. So. Thank you for that. It's very interesting. Uh, just a very brief point of information, Rodney, on the uh, New Zealand case. I was circulated on the, the, the same note, and um, all I saw was a, a, 